Thank you. So, um, I, I took a class uh, for dual enrollment during when I, I finished high school and I graduated. Uh, but during that, my senior year, I took a, a dual enrollment program at Sheridan Technical. And I did their, uh, their construction and building trades uh, program. And um, they had a lathe, which is funny because uh, my teacher didn't quite know how to use a lathe, so I kind of showed him a lot about the lathe. Uh, but we learned a lot about safety, especially always having a spotter or uh, knowing what's what you need to be aware of when you're using tools. So um, the lathe, to me, is seems like the, it's it seems like the most dangerous tool to me because it goes really fast and it's uh, and the piece can come flying. At you. I mean, any tool can do that, but it just seems like a higher risk for me. So for a senior project, uh, I decided to go over lay the lathe and the tools, and I wanted to cut it down to lathe safety because that's a very important thing, is you want to be safe uh, and not lose any fingers, because fingers are important. So uh, I'm going to go over a few things. We have a lathe, uh, pieces that go with the lathe, um, what safety equipment you need, uh, tool safety. <coughs> So the first part is we have um, the parts of the lathe. Uh, you, might, you might not think that the parts of the lathe are important, but they are. Um, because if you know the parts of the lathe, you can communicate well, uh, you can learn the proper functions, and ensuring a uh, safe operation while using it. Um, for the lathe, you have the bed of the lathe, which is uh, what everything slides on, especially the tool rest and uh, the tailstock. Those slide onto the bed of the lathe. Um, and then you have your headstock. This is your headstock. Uh, your headstock has your emergency shutoff switch, which your emergency shutoff switch is very important because if something does happen, if something gets caught, you want to be able to shut that down immediately. Um, uh, when you have a, a headstock, they also have a variable speed. Those to me seem better than um, trying to switch the bands every time. The variable speed um, is one thing that you don't realize is um, when you turn, when you just hit the emergency stop to turn it on, but you're going like a uh, thousand RPM, it's when you turn it back on, it goes immediately right back to a thousand RPM. So the variable speed is. Um, a lot of times, instead of shutting it off, you just turn it down to zero, okay. and so that it, it stops the, the machine from turning. So if you walk away from the machine or you're fixing something, you turn it all the way down, and then you, if you want to, you can shut it off. So that when you put it back on, it doesn't go immediately right back to 1,000 or 2,000 RPM, which can be dangerous. So being able to turn it down is, is very nice to do. Um, the, the headstock holds on holds the chucks. Uh, there's a um, the chucks that goes onto the spindle, and then you also have um, I forgot what it was called. Drive spur. Yeah, there there's a another piece called a drive spur that goes in the middle of the spindle that also holds on. Um, your speed control. Uh, you also have your tool rest is here. The tool rest. Um, is held by the banjo, and the banjo sits on the bed of the, the lathe. The tool rest is important because you want to be able to hold your, your, uh, your tool down. Because if you, it's, you can't, if you don't hold it down, and you catch something, it's going to catch and come flying at you. So if you have nothing there to stop it from moving, then it's it's not very safe. Um, so make sure that your hand is. Your hand is not uh, behind the tool rest because the tool rest uh, has to be a certain part away from the wood. So make sure your fingers are not uh, behind it because then it'll spin and then there goes your fingers. And that's, yeah. you definitely want to keep your hands. Mike, Mike can demonstrate that. Mike, demonstrate. <laughs> demonstrate what happens when you put your fingers on the wrong side. You lose, you lose the end of your finger and if it's really bad, you lose more than that. 
You also want to keep your, your tool like sturdy on because if it's not sturdy and you're not holding it down, it'll fly up when you catch a part of the bark or wood, there's like a hole and you grab it. Um, you also want to keep your, your hand in front of, of the tool rest and sitting, you want this part of your hand to sit on the tool rest so that you're holding it down on top but you're also holding enough that you can slide easily across without it jumping. Um, your tail stock is uh, removable. Uh, it also has a, a quill, so you put all the pieces through the quill, and then you will tighten it with the hand wheel. If it's not tight enough, um, it can it'll keep spinning, but the the piece that's in it uh, won't. And then something can go flying if it's not holding uh, tight enough. Your piece can just spin out and then go flying, which is go right to your face. And I think everyone wants to keep their eyes or their nose intact. Or their teeth. Or their yeah. teeth. Or your teeth. <laughs> Always make sure that uh, the hand wheel is tight. It's a really big thing if it's not tight enough. Ron would always come up to be like, make sure that wheel, he literally, he just, he'll just walk up and then just keep, just turn it just to make sure. So those are the parts of the lathe, uh, based knowledge and safety that you need to know. So that's part of the communication. Uh, the lathe attachments. Um, a lot of the lathe attachments, uh, you'll have uh, headstock attachments, you'll have the tailstock, and then you have a, a lot of the Jacob Chucks will be both. So what goes on the head the headstock is you have your face plate, which can mount to the wood by uh, screwing it in, and then you have your your chuck, which uh, clamps it down from the outside um, of like a tenant. You do a dovetail tenant, and it'll clamp down around the outside to hold it. Um, the spur is that drive spur. I couldn't find any picture of it, but it's a little piece, um, kind of like a live end, but it goes uh, it goes on the headstock, and it's uh, probably the most common. So the spur, the face plate, uh, are the most common, and the, the four jaw chuck you see there is relatively new, but becoming common. Um, Jacob chucks, as I said, can be used for, for both uh, headstock and live and the, <clears throat> the tail stock, sorry, uh, depending on what you're using it for. Um, so. That's basically the attachments. The live end, there's more, there's a bunch of different kind of live ends. Um, that's the most basic one you see, but there's a bunch of different types for different things. And I couldn't quite find any photos of it. So, but that's your most common. And then your Jacob's Chuck, uh, you have one that twists uh, tightening, and then the other, there's another one that you use a, a key. Um, I have the one that twists. But when you have the one that twists, you've really got to make sure that it's on there tight, or else uh, sometimes when you're cutting, it'll un untighten and loosen, and then it's not safe because it's not tight enough. So you always want everything to be tight when it's on the machine. Uh, with the chuck key, you always want to make sure it's really tight on there. Same thing with the, the twist technique. So your safety and PPE, which is your uh, personal protection equipment is a very important thing to me is um, so you have always be wearing a face shield and then you have a dust mask because there's a lot of dust that comes off the machines and then you have gloves. Gloves. Um, gloves? <laughs> yes. I'm a lady. Well here's the thing about gloves is that um, for me personally uh, when I started doing it when my hand would be on the tool rest when I would turn it it'd come off really hot and so it would burn this part of my hand. And I didn't want it to burn, so I put a glove on. But um, Lee told me uh, once, or I heard from you, some of you guys, that you cut off the, the fingers. Because you do not want any part of the fingers to get caught. I did have, uh, I was wearing a glove one time, like the blue ones. Those are just rubber and they'll uh, break. Oh, the nitro. Yeah. And so uh, it got caught somewhere. And good thing the, the fingers are longer than mine, so it only took the tip of it, but it kind of grabbed it, and my hand went like that against the machine, and so I cut my hand. There's still a scar there. 
So, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I didn't tell you about that. I'm really, really sorry. If you do use it for uh, for the burning, just make sure all the fingers are cut off so there's nothing yeah. to be able to grab or pull. Because if it does grab or pull, it will bring your hand flying forward. And you don't, again, you don't want to lose fingers. So, biker gloves are still in. They're cool. So. But only if you need it, if it's necessary. Otherwise, don't. Um, those rubber ones are, you only use that if you have um, liquid or oil, but make sure the machine is off when you're using it. So be careful what you do with those. Um, the face shields are very important. They're a very crucial part of it because when you're cutting something, pieces will come flying off. Like I was cutting something and then a giant piece of bark uh, clipped in and it came off, but I had the face shield, so it bounced off the corner and flew the other way. So I was good with that. So you have, a, there's good, there's a better, and there's best. So for the face shield, there's, you have the good, which is, it's more of a flimsy plastic, um, mostly for like spray or anything liquid coming at your face. It's not really that sturdy. Um, your better is, is what I use at the moment. It's a hard plastic, solid, goes over the head here, so nothing will hit you on top of your head. Well, hopefully it doesn't. <laughs> uh, so that one's uh, pretty good. Uh, the best one uh, goes all the way over and also comes uh, a harder plastic, comes down around the chin, so nothing hits you right here. I mean, either way, both cover, but that one just has a harder plastic going all the way around. And um, your dust mask. All these uh, older guys, older than me, young, young like men, <laughs> yeah, young ladies, <laughs> uh, will always tell me to uh, have a dust mask. Because when you get older and you, uh, you didn't wear a dust mask, <laughs> it will hurt your lungs. And you need your lungs. <laughs> your lungs are very important. So. Uh, always wear a dust mask or a respirator uh, because it's very important because you don't want sawdust in your lungs because sawdust cannot break down like certain things and so it'll just stay there. So you have your good which is just what we've been using for COVID is the little the, uh, dust mask that you see in the hospital and stuff. Uh, the better is um, an N95. An N95 it goes tightly around the face <coughs> and holds everything together unlike the, the good one which is okay. It'll go tightly and hold on. Uh, your best one uh, has air, has um, filters, so when the dust goes in, you can always change out those filters. It'll stop it from going, from going all the way through. So those are replaceable. The, um, the N95s are not replaceable. You have to change them out every time you use it. But uh, your, best dust, your best respirator is that one which you can switch out the filters, and it's reusable. So those are your good, your good ones. It also doesn't <laughs> fog up your mask. <laughs> yeah. that That's true. That is yeah. true. N95, it'd it always be fogged up, like a respirator. Yeah. No, no problem with it. And by the end, it's like kind of torn up, so you might want to switch it once or twice. But those, uh, those are good. And you actually get oxygen flow through yeah, the mask. I have no problem breathing with my respirator yeah. whatsoever, and it never fogs up my mask. Yeah, and you always want to uh, switch out. If you use the lathe often, you always want to switch out uh, the filters, like maybe once or twice, uh, once a week or every two weeks, just to make sure. If you don't do it that often, just make sure you know how much, uh, how many, how much you've been using it. Just make sure it's switched out to a clean one. Uh, tool safety. So there's only a little bit of information here, but I wanted to talk about a little bit more than that. So um, tools, uh, the tools you use, like the ball gouge and the, um, the parting tool, uh, these tools can be uh, not safe if you're not doing it the right way. So tools, you have to be, they have to be held a certain way. If some tools have to be higher than center or on center or below, depending on what tool it is, um, if it's not held held the right way, you can catch and then a chunk or something will come flying. You can break the tool, and then that's expensive to replace. Um, there's also another thing about these tools is uh, I've learned that sharp tools 
are, are so much safer and better than dull tools because uh, there was a point where I realized that when I was making a pen, uh, my tool was too dull because it caught and then a whole chunk came off. I mean, it flew that way, but then the whole, I had like half a pen. And so I just kind of glued it back on <laughs> and put the sawdust back in. It worked. But um, and then I went to Stuart's house to sharpen it and learn how to sharpen the right way. So, and it worked so much better. So make sure your tools are sharp. Um, if you're not sure if they're sharp enough, sharpen them anyways. Uh, if you're using them constantly, if you're doing like a project that takes a couple hours, make sure you sharpen it every 10 minutes. Uh, if the piece is hard or, um, or like really hard, make sure it's sharp every 10, 10, 15 minutes, go back, just check. If you're not sure, again, just sharpen it anyways. It's always, it's always good to do that. So, so it was carving. Huh? Wood carving, uh, um, uh, sharp knives cut wood, dull knives cut fingers. And it's, um, in some ways it's that, that way with wood turning tools. Yeah. So, sharp tools will cut really nicely. Your other ones will just keep bouncing and then eventually catch something. Can I add something too, which is probably a lesson you received as well, but when I was learning, when Ron was out there and uh, Bobby teaching me, one of the things they taught me with tools and helps to keep you from getting catches that you want to finesse. Finesse is a big word that Ron used with me, so you don't want to like, you know, but you want to approach the wood carefully and lightly, and that will keep you from getting yeah. catches rather than kind of forcing your tools into it. So a lot of the tools uh, with that, a lot of the tools, uh, it's safer to uh, start easy and then uh, ride the beveled edge first and go easy and then once you have it in the right spot then you slowly move it to place where it will start cutting and then you can turn it depending on the tool but always if I find it better that you ride on the bevel first and then you turn it to where it needs to be and it wherever it cuts, it'll cut. You don't need a lot of pressure. If the tool's sharp, you don't need a lot of pressure. If you're putting a lot of pressure, your tool is probably dull. So that's a good time to sharpen it. So you don't need a lot of pressure if it's sharp. Okay. So that's for, for tools. Um, this was one major thing that we went over in my class <coughs> was uh, having a clean workspace. Because when you do the lathe and when you're sanding or cutting, there's a lot of dust going everywhere. As we know, wood catches on fire, and so uh, we want to make sure everything's clean because um, there's chips everywhere. Clean up. So we have um, to clean up your bench. Bless you. I put it as a, a bench brush because that's what I called it. Uh, but you can just wipe the, the bench down and into a dustpan. You have um, what we used in our shop for the school was we had a big uh, bag dust collectors for uh, like a couple like two, three machines you'll connect to, but those are a good way to collect dust, but you do have to take it out and uh, spray it, like air hose it down outside uh, just to clean it. So every week or every uh, every two weeks, just make sure the dust is cleaned out of it. Um, okay. Yeah, so even, so after you've done for the day, always make sure, like right now I have to go clean my shop because I've noticed it was a little dirty and my mother is shaking her head at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, make sure your area is clean. Um, uh, there's a picture of a uh, shop vac. That's a vac you can use for um, just to clean up your area, like your floor. Just get everything wiped down. Uh, a lot of the fine dust, like the sanding dust, uh, as you said, can get on the floor and that can become really slippery. So if you don't have good traction, uh, you can easily just slide and like fall right back. So your foot can come out of you. So. And then, what's that? So, I've, I've, there's, uh, it's like a funnel uh, that they put on the back of a miter saw or uh, certain uh, blades that we use uh, in class that I've seen. And those, instead of all the dust flying everywhere, it'll, uh, the vacuum will connect to it and pull it back so that it doesn't go all over the place. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention was uh, how to sweep in, in a shop is because um, a lot of people will sweep normally and they'll make big like big sweeps but that will bring the dust everywhere and bring it up 
So you just want a, a light, just push it over to the side so that it stays on the floor and doesn't go up in the air. And leave your dust mask on while you're cleaning up. <laughs> yes, that is a major thing. Leave the dust mask on. Because when the dust does come up, you want it to not, again, not go in your lungs. Almost every class I've taught, everybody puts all their stuff away in their dust mask and then, then they clean up and raise all the dust. People, leave it on your face. <laughs> a really, really efficient way is to uh, open up all your doors and windows and go to a deep floor. Yeah, my dad would do that. We have a floor and he'll take the uh, battery out of my fan and put it in the lead floor and then, and then it'll go everywhere. And then it'll go out of the garage onto my car. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, no, and he's the guy that, that washes the car and waxes them, so he'll just ruin what he did for the past two hours. <laughs> so I don't recommend um, a leaf blower unless you want it to get everywhere. And then he won't put the battery back into my fan, so I have to go run and find it. <laughs> um, uh, if you're using oils for finishing, you always want to make sure those are closed, um, especially uh, shellac is combustible, so if you're using those rags, make sure you put it outside to dry, and then once it's dry, you can throw it away. But um, certain things, you want to just make sure they're stored, they're closed, because uh, oils, like shellac, can be dangerous. Um, so that, yeah, uh, just clean up your area, make sure there's no dust lying around. Because if something does spark or something goes wrong, that dust can, can catch fire. Mm. And then it's not very good. There goes all your stuff and possibly your home. <laughs> yeah. So you don't want that. And then mom and dad will be really mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's all I got. All right.